one minute. One minute. I've had a lot of one minute moments in my life. I once held my breath underwater for one minute. I once had a staring contest with my husband that lasted a minute, and I won, because I didn't blink once. I once had a really awkward romantic encounter with a guy in college that lasted maybe 45 seconds. But with the 15 seconds remaining, I said, oh honey, let's not do this again. <laughs> I've had some interesting one minute moments, as I'm sure all of you have as well. But no one minute has ever been as impactful on my life as the one minute I watched my son die or the thousands of minutes that have come after using that pain as a bridge to my purpose. I remember the day that I found out that I was pregnant. I was looking at that pregnancy test and having experienced a miscarriage already, I wasn't just looking at two blue lines in my hand, I was looking at hope. I was looking at a second chance. I went into the bedroom to tell my husband the amazing news. And I wish I could tell you that it was like one of those scenes you see in the movie where the husband finds out he's going to be a dad and he picks his wife up and he twirls her around and he yells from the window, I'm going to be a dad! None of those things happened. Instead, he expressed his fear. Miscarriages have a way of tainting subsequent pregnancies. Eleven weeks, we balance somewhere between fear and excitement. Until I met with a specialist at our 11-week ultrasound appointment and our fears were confirmed, she looked me dead in the eye and she said, detach yourself from this baby. Your son is going to die in utero. She called it an insufficient placenta. And the word insufficient in that moment didn't just describe my placenta. The word insufficient described me as a wife, as a mother, as a woman. I struggled for 13 weeks with the word insufficient as well as my own insecurities until February 26, 2008, when our son was born. And I wish I could say that after my C-section, I saw him lying there on that table and I felt relief. Relief that she was wrong. He wouldn't die in utero. I wasn't insufficient. He was right there. But I never felt any of those things. Even when he opened his eyes for the first time, even when he kicked the nurse, even on the day of his day after when he was born and he peed in his diaper and the whole hospital staff celebrated, I never felt relief. He was barely the size of my palm, just over half a pound. As a mother, you don't feel relief in that moment. You feel utterly crippling fear. February 28th started the way it does for many NICU moms. I spent hours with him that day. And I would look at the other women in envy. They would hold their babies kangaroo style, building that bond. And all I had was an index finger. And I would put my finger inside the incubator and I would just gently rub the patches of hair on his head. And one moment in particular, he took his hand and he gripped the tip of my finger. And I reveled in that moment. It was the closest he and I had been in two days. A few hours passed and I decided to get something to eat and as I was eating some rubbery chicken fingers from the hospital cafeteria, there was a knock on the door. The NICU nurse stood there with tears in her eyes and she said, they need you downstairs. And despite having had a C-section just two days prior, I have never run so fast in my entire life. And I got inside and I don't know if it was napping time, but the entire room was dark, save for this one bright light shining down on my son's incubator. And I realized, wow, the specialist was right. He would die just not at the time she anticipated. One minute, one minute where I felt like I was drowning and I couldn't breathe and my husband and I, we shared a stare, but this time I wasn't going to win. It wasn't some silly contest. There were no romantic, awkward encounters, just 
stifled tears from the doctors and nurses. My husband looked at our son and he said, you did a great job. I'm proud of you and you can let go now. I heard a woman screaming, this gut-wrenching, soul-filled battle cry. And as my husband held me on the floor, I realized that woman was me. I have never experienced pain of that magnitude before where your soul is broken. And maybe you haven't either, and you're sitting there going, not me, but haven't we all experienced pain in some capacity? Isn't pain what connects us to not just our purpose, but to each other? I'm sure you're sitting there wondering, how did Mahdi survive those long nights where there's no baby to nurse but an overfilling milk supply, an empty nursery with just ashes inside? The truth is, I don't know. <laughs> but I do know that there were five things that I realized about that pain that has led me to the woman that I am today. One, I got connected to that pain. Think about it this way. You will never forget your first real heartbreak. The one where you didn't shower for two days and you were covered in cheese curls and chocolate chip cookies thinking I'll never find anyone again. The mother of an addict will never forget when her child became a statistic on the news. I will never forget that I finally did hold my son in kangaroo style fashion, but he was dead and blue on my chest. But you're not just connected to that person or that event, you're now connected to thousands of people who have yet to experience pain and you get to be the game changer for all of them. Two, pain makes you stronger. Maybe it's physical therapy that you go through to get some type of semblance of strength and you are able to walk again after some tragic accident and you go, I did that. Maybe it's psychological therapy that you go through and you stop eating cheese curls and chocolate chip cookies and you get out there and you try again. Or if you're like me, you go to church because nothing else but prayer could possibly save you on those long, lonely nights. But either way, don't you realize, wow, nothing will ever break me like that moment ever again. And you develop skills to get stronger, and you don't just develop skills for yourself, but you start to develop skills to help other people, which is now my life work. Three, desire. You start to desire so badly happiness and you seek it every day. For me, it was weightlifting. I love the euphoric release of picking up a heavy weight and slamming it back down. But it didn't just become something I wanted to do every day. It started to become this burning fire inside of me. And I started to connect with other people in my community who were like-minded individuals using health and fitness as a way to release their own pain. And before I knew it, that fire burning inside of me, it became number four, my passion. I was no longer documenting tears at night. I was documenting ideas, the next event, the next charity, the next people I could inspire and impact. And one day, I realized, like I'm sure you have, like I'm sure a lot of the speakers did on this stage today, that I had arrived to number five, my purpose. All those hours of grieving that you did, crying, praying, it led to the person you are today. I'm grateful to say that I have restored and empowered thousands of other people in my life, but it had to start with me. And restoration is a beautiful thing. I now live this abundant and rich life in an unbreakable marriage because he and I survived that together. And I'm so proud to say that a year after my son's death, my son DJ was born, thus fulfilling my purpose as a mother and healing me with his love. Maybe you're sitting there and you're wondering, I could use restoration, but I don't even know where to start. I'm somewhere on that bridge between pain and purpose. I have two words of advice for you. Start somewhere anywhere along those five steps, and I guarantee that you will arrive at your purpose. 
my son, Noah Abram Still, died so that I could stand on this red carpet and talk to all of you today. That was his purpose. That was his gift. How will you take my son's gift and move it forward? Thank you.